So I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the uh, tools I've been involved in building to do force alignment and also maybe offering up a bit of uh, a menu of the kind of uh, options that are available to you. So um, I'm a, a linguist, a sociolinguist. I study mostly uh, changes in pronunciation. Uh, and I'm not actually still quite clear where everybody's information level is at. So if, if I'm talking about things at a level that is, you feel patronizing because it's too, I'm telling Nana how to suck eggs, uh, I apologize. I, had, I tried to pitch it uh, uh, a, bit, uh, a bit basic, so. Um, so uh, I was in a situation uh, when I was working on my uh, PhD where what we had was uh, a lot of uh, really great data um, rotting on uh, magnetic tape. Uh, and uh, this is a collection of data that my uh, supervisor, also pictured there, was uh, involved in collecting over 40 years in Philadelphia. Uh, these were sociolinguistic interviews conducted with everyday Philadelphians. Um, the sociolinguistic interviews uh, would ask basic demographic questions and then turn to trying to elicit uh, narratives of personal experience. So things like, um, did you ever get blamed for something you didn't do? Or uh, was, there, was there ever a time when you thought, this is it, I'm going to die? Uh, and these, once you get people warmed up, these are, these are actually pretty good topics. Uh, but of course, our primary, oh, that's great. Our primary uh, focus, of course, we're interested in, in what people had to say, but we're also interested in how they said it, right? So what we had was this static data, and what we wanted was something like this. Now, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much phonetics anybody knows. This is a uh, representation of how uh, people are pronouncing uh, the sound I. Uh, and uh, this is it, how that pronunciation changed over time over the, the 20th century, right? This is what we're interested in, right? Um, I'll just let that play out. So this is the result of um, a statistical model over the uh, acoustic data that we managed to collect. So uh, how did we get from what we had to what we wanted? Uh, so first we had to convert all the analog recordings to a, di a digital format. So that was a project. Uh, and preserve the most important metadata. And I'm sorry I missed most of the talks yesterday, but apparently that was a big topic of conversation. Then we had to, and this is very much what John was talking about, identify where in the audio the speech sounds of particular interest were. We had to know where each and every I, ow, oo, o, a sound was. Then, and that's going to be the focus of what I'm going to be talking about here because it seems to be the uh, uh, topic of most uh, relevance or most interest here. Then uh, there was other issues, right? So once we know where in the audio speech sound is, we had to automate, uh, really get, and re we really had to automate, given the volume of data we had, the, uh, the acoustic analysis of the speech sounds, which was a separate kind of project that I won't be talking as much about, uh, but was also a really big uh, component. And then, of course, apply statistical analysis to the, uh, the acoustic data that we collected, which the output of which is what you saw just a moment ago. Uh, so identifying where in the audio a speech sound is, that is forced alignment, right? Uh, which, uh, in case the, the name is opaque, you take uh, uh, the, the words and the speech segments that you know to be in the audio from a transcript, and you force an alignment of that to the audio, right? And that's, this is what it looks like. This is some audio of me saying, actually, it's actually me saying, uh, well, there was one time, and this is the output of that forced alignment. Uh, and you can see it did pretty well. Uh, the, a speech segment layer is a little crowded up here, but you can see, well, there was one time. And even if you're not used, used to reading spectrograms, if, if you're not used to reading spectrograms, this is done actually pretty well. Uh, so uh, I'm interested in finding speech sounds in audio, right? But uh, finding words of particular interest in audio is another thing that might be of some interest. I'm just trying to sell why you might want to do force alignment. 
Here's a really interesting pattern I found in these sociolinguistic interviews, right, which most of them are going to be narratives of personal experience. Such a thing happened to me, and then, and then the next complicating event occurred, and then there was the conclusion. And in these uh, uh, narratives of personal experience, it looks like the distribution of days of the week follows a very interesting pattern. Um, a lot of discussion of Sunday, um, Monday, nobody likes talking about Wednesdays, and then there's the weekend again, which is actually an interesting kind of pattern. Um, and that's the kind of thing where maybe you, you've done all this work, and then you get this data out, and now this is driving your next sort of question. Well, what are they talking about? Right? Uh, they're talking mostly about Sunday. I mean, maybe that's because they're mostly uh, 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 Italian, Irish, American Catholics. Um, and issues of religious belief and experience come up frequently. Football. Or football, right. <laughs> the other American religion. <laughs> um, so uh, the rest of the presentation is going to be me talking a bit about some of the necessary bits and pieces that uh, are needed for forced alignment, uh, and uh, what then uh, summing up with some of the, the, the tools that are available for you to do forced alignment at home. So bits and pieces and issues for doing forced alignment. I'm going to talk about a few things, all, uh, uh, sort of the, everything that's needed to, to do forced alignment. Uh, not all of these pieces you are going to need to, to provide as the end user. But I figured I'd talk about all of it just to uh, demystify it a bit, or just so you know what all the moving parts are. Uh, so maybe the first big issue is you need a pronouncing dictionary, right? So you need some way to look up in a dictionary, here is this word well, what are the speech segments in it, right? And uh, uh, this is a, there are pronouncing dictionaries out there for uh, many languages, um, but it's sort of a non-trivial issue. So, uh, and some of the interesting uh, issues that do come up when it comes to the pronouncing dictionary are what do you do about multiple pronunciations? So, uh, for example, here's an interesting case, and I'm, I'm just drawing this out of my mind, a talk I just saw at the Northern English's workshop on uh, three uh, variants of walking, right? So there is the uh, broad English standard walking, then there is the uh, not as standard walk-in that everybody says, um, and then in the north there is walking, which comes up with some frequency. Uh, so there's a question of, you know, you have all of these uh, variants. How do you deal with this? You know, the fact speakers are going to be producing all of these variants. Um, how do you deal with this for the alignment? And I think there's different philosophies out there. I'm not sure what what John's feeling is. So that's option that's option one at least, right? So. Let the, uh, let the aligner figure out which option to use. So uh, one of the pros is you'll get a more accurate uh, timing information and uh, a better alignment and, and uh, a more accurate, in some sense, phonetic transcription. Some cons to this are in uh, choosing pronunciation variants if the particular variant that was chosen is your research question. Um, Right, so uh, uh, Bailey was interested in which one of these particular things do people say at which frequency. Um, it, it's the case that some aligners agree with humans at a lower rate than humans agree with, human coders agree with each other. So that's an issue. Maybe this is something that needs to go be back and be corrected. It can be tricky to identify which pronunciation variants are variants of each other too from, from if, if all you get out of the alignment is the, the one option. So one approach, and this is sort of how I've been leaning a bit more, is to only allow the aligner to choose one option. You take a hit in terms of the accuracy of the alignment and the timing and the, in the phonetic transcript, but allows me, you know, if I know all instances of ing, no matter how they came out, did the person say walk in, walking, walking, in the alignment, they're all going to be given an ing 
sequence, I can look up all those ing sequences and do the coding, uh, some auditory coding, and then train a classifier if I want to or whatever. This is the way I've been leaning, but there's, it sort of depends on what your, your goals are, really. Um, so issue two that's always going to come up when you're doing alignment is out of dictionary words, right? Now, these are frequently proper names, which I guess we would be anonymizing anyway, but street names, you know? So here's uh, Fruwald up there, or uh, regional terms, things like hoagie, which if you don't know, that's the Philadelphian word for a, a sub sandwich. Sort of grinds my gears a little bit to say sub. It's, it's a hoagie. Um, so these either need to be added to the dictionary when the aligner is run, which is what we do with our system, which means if, you run, if you're running the aligner, you sort of need to know the transcription, state, the, how to type in these speech segments. Or there are other separate pieces of software which will try to guess the, the uh, speech segments based on the spelling. Uh, so uh, I should say, uh, you might need to provide these out of dictionary items as the end user, but this pr pronunciation dictionary, it comes typically bundled with the aligner. So that's something the aligner is using, not something you necessarily need to provide. Something you definitely don't need to provide, unless you're training your own aligner, are the acoustic models, right? In some sense, this is the most complicated bit, and I'm going to use the simplest figure to represent it. Uh, but these are the three W's from that little recording of me saying, well, there was one time. Well, there was one time. That's right. Um, and uh, what the uh, aligner, this is really the, the bulk of what it, it has, is um, statistical models of, you know, you look at these three W's, they're different durations, they've got different acoustics. What the, uh, what the aligner systems are using is actually not anything that you are actually looking at up here. They're not human interpretable. Uh, but they, the point is they need to figure out, you know, uh, this looks like it could pop, this bit of chunk of audio looks like it could be a W and, and so on and so on for all the speech sounds. So uh, the big piece that, then this is the one big item that you, as the end user, do need to provide for the aligner is a, a transcript of some sort. Uh, and I guess many of you would know, outside of the original field work, this can be the most expensive and, and time consuming um, aspect, right? But of course, it's valuable. Uh, and of course, uh, I would recommend using Elon. Um, this is uh, an Elon transcription that I did. This is actually a uh, uh, a press, uh, Jimmy Carter's first press conference, complaining about the Soviet Union and all that. So let me see how I am on time. Okay, I can do this. Yeah, great. So uh, I'll go very basically through how it works. Again, this is a demystifying process, right? So uh, your uh, the aligner has looked up a word in the pronunciation dictionary. Uh, the, the word you wrote down was the, and it said, okay, these are the two speech segments that are in the word the. And uh, the aligner's model of how the world works is speech segments have a beginning, middle, and end. At least the one I'm working with, they can vary. Um, and uh, so z has a beginning, middle, and end, and uh has a beginning, middle, and end. And it also knows there's some probability that if you're in the beginning state of z, you might transition to the middle or you might stay in the beginning, and so on. You know, if you're in the middle, you might transition to the end, or you might stay in the middle. So it knows approaching the problem, uh, we're going to have some audio. The word the is in there. And there's going to be a sequence of beginning, middle, and end transitions between the th and the uh, and within them. And the beginning, middle, and end of all of these speech segments has a probabilistic statistical model of what the acoustics for the beginning state of th should be, and what the middle state of uh, uh, th should be. So it tries to work out, here is the actual audio that it's, that it's presented with. 
where from one window of analysis to the next, we have this transition in the audio. And it needs to figure out, does this transition in the audio represent a transition from beginning to middle or from beginning to beginning? And it tries to work that out by balancing out, balancing out um, what's the probability that we would have stayed in the beginning, and if we're, we're in the beginning, we would have emitted this audio, what's the prob versus what's the, prob the joint probability we would have transitioned to the middle, and then being in the middle, emitted this audio. And then it, it does that out for the whole sequence, and we get, uh, this is how it works out what the alignment should be. It tries to optimize it across the whole audio stream. It can uh, take a while. And we found, actually, that uh, aligning on many small chunks is faster than aligning one big chunk, right? So chunking up the audio because of the optimization it tries to do. If it's trying to optimize many times over a small window, it can do it, it, can do it quicker. So some concerns that are out there about forced alignment is it will make mistakes. And it will make mistakes, um, uh, as John was pointing out. Uh, but it is also easier and faster, and since faster, cheaper, to uh, manually, collect, uh, manu manually correct the output of the automated system then to create, manually create the anno these annotations from scratch. Uh, and it's the case, you know, humans make mistakes too, right? Except we're cha more chaotic systems. So uh, the kinds of errors that these automated systems make are usually systematic in some sense, so that they are, in, on the one hand, easier to find, and on the other, uh, correctable. <coughs> Uh, this is a kind of a strange one that gets thrown at me that these, these automated systems, th this is sort of me talking to the sociolinguists in my life, uh, that it's a black box, which uh, it's not, at least the aligner we're developing and the software we're developing is being developed in the open, Anyo and anyone can download the code. Uh, what they mean by black box is I, I, I don't understand what's in it. Uh, you are a black box, is what I have to say. Uh, you know, the whole reason we are involved in this enterprise is because the nature of human knowledge and the nature of the decisions we make are an unsolved problem, and you're just applying that problem to uh, creating the data in the first place. So, yeah. Um, uh, another concern uh, that I've heard is that this automation process sort of removes me from my data. I don't have a a feeling for it anymore. And in some sense, I can see how this is true. Uh, it, this automation, you, you know, you, you have this big collection of data that you're, you haven't read or listened through every little bit of it. it. But it does wind up sort of inverting the direction of hypothesis generation and exploration. Um, so whereas you might have arrived at this thought, oh, I should talk, think about how people are talking about days of the week, or what are they talking about, from listening to lots of recordings. And then you would realize, oh, this is something I should look into. This sort of inverts that direction, where you've got the big picture. You've got this graph. And then you, and then you need to sort of iterate back and drill down into the data in detail. It's not an excuse to not understand your data, is what I would say. OK. So doing force alignment at home. Uh, so I've been involved in developing uh, the Fave suite. It's actually two pieces of software, an aligner um, and a Bayesian formant analyzer. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the formant analysis. That's, that's the acoustics. The aligner is based on uh, the P2FA system, which was it's trained its acoustic models on, I think it's 25 or so hours of US Supreme Court oral argumentation and has fairly good uh, time accuracy. This is a histogram of uh, errors, you know, how, how offset each uh, boundary was from a, a human annotated gold standard. Uh, so some of the benefits of FAVE as your use uh, tool to use is it's, uh, de it's been developed uh, for sociolinguists. So we are assuming that multiple talkers is the default case. We always have more than one person on the audio. 
Um, and it's also uh, developed in the open. It's all the code and everything is available on, on GitHub. You can go download it right now. Um, and trying to be as cross-platform friendly as possible, which is a chore, but, uh, but I want people to use it. So it needs to work on their computer. Um, it's written in Python, uh, which is a widely understand, understood programming language. Um, and uh, um, it's a relatively simple and flexible th uh, thing, right? So the fave force aligner does basically one thing, which means that the code is relatively simple uh, and readable. So if you were to hire a pro, if you got money to hire a programmer um, and they have some Python experience, they could probably work with what we got. Uh, and as just some evidence of this, there are people, if you look at the commit log, there are people who are not just me and not just people from my uh, research group who have push, uh, sent pull requests to the repository and have contributed to the code, right? So people who are not deeply involved with this system have made edits and changes to the code. And the primary developer is friendly and responsive. That's me. Uh, so the, the acoustic models of Fave uh, were based on North American uh, audio, uh, but uh, uh, Mackenzie and Turton have found it. It compares very favorably to other aligners on, on British data. Uh, it is only English. Um, uh, another con would be that uh, the acoustic models are not particularly f flexible. It does what it does, and it's not retrainable, really. My recommended uh, way to th that I would recommend to use Fave is to uh, download it and install it locally. Uh, so we have a, a wiki page with some extensive documentation for how to install it and how to use it. And there's a, 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 a user's uh, um, mailing list that I try, to, I try to respond to as quickly as I can. Uh, what Fave needs as input is the audio, obviously, and transcriptions uh, partially time aligned, right? So chunked up like this as you would transcribe it with, uh, if you have multiple speakers, separate it out onto separate tiers. There's also the Prosody Lab aligner, uh, which has been developed at the University of McGill. Uh, so its pros and cons are going to be largely the same as Fave, because it's a very similar kind of system. Uh, one of the big benefits to Prosody Lab is it has a retraining of its acoustic models built into it. I, I haven't actually tried doing it, but you are able to do it. And I also know the guy who develops it, and he tends to be fairly responsible, responsive to these things, too. Uh, it doesn't quite have a streamlined facility for handling multiple talkers. Uh, and again, my recommended usage would be to download and install. There's a uh, web mouse, which is uh, uh, an aligner. Uh, the m mouse is Munich. Uh, I'm not sure what it stands for. Developed in association with ClarenD. It's a web-based platform, which makes it easy to use. It's kind of click and drag. Um, it's with any kind of system that people have built and put out there, it's maybe less adaptable. So I like to have something installed locally so that I can pipe it into my own scripts and have it do exactly what I want. And I've had slightly less success with web mouse. But the fact that it's, it's available online is, is, uh, is good. Um, so this is something I've just recently started thinking about. And I don't know how it works everywhere else. So uh, in the UK, at least, uh, we need to ensure that data audio that has personally identified, has sensitive information, you know, even if the, you know, no matter what people have signed off on the consent forms, can't leave the European economic area. So the, serv the web mail servers, you know, that won't be an issue for me, uh, but double check. Uh, so my recommended usage for web mouse would be to go to the website and, and click and drag and, and have at it. Uh, it's also, uh, B th this is, it'll communicate through Elon, I learned yesterday, um, in a really cool way. Uh, so uh, it's not in the Elon software. It's, up, again, uploading the uh, audio and the transcript to the, to the servers and then sending you back the results. 
There's also Darla, which is a really cool system, uh, something I'm, I would like to get more in, uh, uh, experience using. It has uh, automated speech recognition as the first step, right? So actually, what you submit to Darla is just the audio. It tries to apply English um, automated speech recognition to create a transcript, and then it will do the alignment. Now, the transcription is errorful, um, but it's just like it's probably it's faster and easier to correct an alignment that comes from an automated system. It's going to be uh, quicker and easier to correct a, a bad automated transcription than to do the transcription by hand in the first place. And I believe they even have a facility where it will s show you this is what this was the most probable uh, text given the audio, and here's the second and third and fourth most probable. The big issue is they don't have their code uh, uh, available to download yet. It's just a web-based service, uh, which means I can't actually use it here in the UK because the servers are in the US. So that's a whole other conversation. So, so the web service is only? You can use it anywhere, right? The issue is, uh, according to your data management laws, can you send an interview to a server in the US? That's the issue. Outside the EU, European Economic Zone or whatever. So my recommended usage until they have the uh, code available to download would be just to go uh, to the website and upload, and upload it there, if you can, depending on what your data is. And uh, that's it. That's, all, that's what I have to say. Thanks.